Welcome to Popcorn Psychology, the podcast where we watch blockbuster movies and psychoanalyze them. My name is Brittany Brownfield, and I'm a child therapist, and I'm joined by... Ben Stover, individual therapist. Hannah Espinoza Rimas, marriage and family therapist. We are all licensed clinical professional counselors, also known as therapists, who practice out of the Ardent Counseling Center in Chicago, Illinois. Even though we are licensed mental health professionals, this podcast is purely for entertainment purposes and to fulfill our love of dissecting pop culture in all forms. And today, we're finally talking about Harry Potter. More yeah. specifically, the first four movies. We're going to do the whole of Harry Potter movie franchise in three different episodes over the next few months we're going to break them up but for the first one we're going to do movies one through four so that is starting with uh sorcerer's stone ending with goblet of fire just because those first especially the first two movies are really just introducing us to the world of harry potter and all the characters and it's not so much i guess messy psychological meat as like especially the back four the last right, four right those a get lot. so much heavier and so yeah. much more adult so we're gonna do five and six together and seven and eight together yep. I mean, especially since seven and eight are the same book essentially so we're gonna do our best to just talk about the first four movies which will be hard i think just because harry potter is so pervasive in culture that i think it's hard to not think of it as a whole story yeah so we're gonna do our best to just keep it to the to not talk too much outside of the first four movies. And we're also, instead of doing themes as how we're dividing it up, the podcast, we're going to do it by um, movies today. So we're going to talk about each movie individually and kind of mm-hmm. what we see in each one and then talk about treatment. And so it might seem a little less, I don't want to say organized because I think it's going to feel maybe not as like, like centered into a theme base, like anchored in themes. So it might be more all over the place and more information than we usually do. Because it isn't centered in themes. But right, yeah. right. Because each movie introduces new characters and new plot lines, but yet it's still part of an overarching plot line. So yeah. there's there's reasons for doing this. Also, when doing research, we kind of figured out that you know, J.K. Rowling, when she did this, she had already planned out one through three as a set arc before she even finished writing the first one. So we kind of found out that you know, like the, the last seven movies in this, they happen at a little different pace, and there's some mm-hmm. things that change, whereas one through three were like a set arc because i would argue that the very end of book a movie four it's gonna be really hard for me to say movie and book like i'll probably interchange those a lot you just say year four year four um is spoiler it's also gonna be full spoilers and so get over that people well i mean Harry um, Potter's been out for you know i yeah. mean yeah i know so because well, i was about so. to say because i because in my opinion um year four with the death of cedric that kind of kicks off everything in terms of i think we're all the heavy duty psychological stuff really comes into play and so that's kind of where this where this episode will end is with that death Mm -hmm. and then so the next ones i think will be meteor but this one is a good introduction to a lot of themes that we will definitely they'll definitely continue to affect harry's life and everyone else's life yeah i think the last four i think just building the relationships and introducing characters and what the world is like and just a lot of that setting all of those things up which i think is also part of what makes the movie so magical well, yeah, mm-hmm. and I think so, and I think it doesn't, like, it turns from being so magical it, right at the end at four, like, when yeah. when Cedric's yeah. father comes out, and, like, oof, you see, like, oof, uh, I cried, like, I cry every time, Harry down, and, like, everyone's, like, the band is playing, and things are going, like, that is signifying the end of the magicalness right there, because, yeah. I mean, then you mm-hmm. meet, you meet Bellatrix, and Fenrir, and you meet, like, the people who are, like, truly evil, whereas, yeah. in this movie, like, or the rest of the movies, like, the big bad is still kind of not really there yet. So you deal with, yeah. like, small bads throughout the rest of the yeah. movies. Yeah, I mean, because what she does so well, and which I really appreciated as a child therapist, is that she really, and by she, I mean J.K. Rowling, she really writes these characters to be the age that they are. And so the first four movies, because they're just younger, it's a lot more simplistic issues, you know, a lot more like child issues that doesn't mean that they're not serious and that they don't have weight because you know everything's important when it's happening to you you know everything's relative mm-hmm. but it doesn't have the gravitas that like the older 
the like the later movies have because they're older and so things are more complicated and more things have happened that make things complicated and also their development is different so they're also able to understand more yeah, as they get older sure. as well and so i think that's also a part of it is that mm-hmm. meeting them and in year one they're so different because they're just little mm-hmm. and they just don't have the development to have kind of those deep issues that come up in the other ones mm-hmm. so the first movie Sorcerer's Stone kind of opens with um, you getting a feel for Harry Potter's home life with the Dursleys, which is probably the most, to me, the most significant thing in the first movie in terms of psychology, which is his life with the Dursleys. I mean, they are neglectful, in my opinion, and they're very emotionally abusive. They don't seem, they're the kind of physically abusive that's usually pretty tolerated, like probably will probably say that they're just firm with him you know they are rough with him but like not necessarily physically abusive that would be like someone's opinion more than it would be like a fact like we're mandated yeah. reporters and it would be a scenario where i probably if i knew i had a client who was getting like living underneath the stairs and being made to do everything in the home like a servant i probably would make a report to child services just to be on the safe side oh, absolutely. but i would doubt that they would investigate it because yeah he still has technically a private room, even though it probably doesn't meet the requirements of a room. Yeah. And he is clothed. He's fed. He doesn't have any, as we can see, any physical like uh, marks on him, like bruises or anything. Right. Like he's technically taken care of. Even they even talk about how they're sending him to away to school, even though it's like, I don't know if away to school, but they're sending him to school. You know, they're dyeing his uniform in like the pot on the stove. That might be the second movie, but like they're technically taking care of him in a way that's recognized by the state i guess yeah <laughs> even though it is horrible how they treat him yeah he's i mean he's absolutely showing signs of someone who's being emotionally abused he doesn't take care of himself he's dirty he's a little timid and afraid of like the people he lives with mm-hmm. and then he doesn't he doesn't stand up for himself but in a way that no. as a child you wouldn't maybe anyway but especially when you don't trust that, like, if you stand up for yourself, you're not going to get retaliated upon. Or don't feel like you have worth. True. And that well. you are allowed to stand up for yourself. He definitely takes a lot of what they ask of him in stride or how they treat him in stride. Like when they're like, start cooking this food, he just starts cooking the food like he. Yeah. He did. There is no like throwing fits or res- or refusing. He is pretty compliant. It would be interesting to see what it was like when he was a baby. Mm hmm. Kind of, and how he was treated, and like, was he left to cry? Yeah. Like, just on end, like, what was that like? And who, mm-hmm. and what did they do before he could help? Right, because we're looking at him, and Harry's 10, He's about a, to be 11, 11 yeah. Yeah. when we first meet him. Yeah. And he gets into the care of the Dursleys when he's one. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I guess all the hatred coming off of them is purely based on i assume the fear of the other because his aunt at least knows that his parents are magical and therefore he's probably magical and so it does seem to be like they just detest him for being different i assume in like a way because he doesn't seem he's a pretty nice kid he doesn't do anything really like he doesn't you know he's not offensive in any way the way that the mother that the aunt says that his mother was a freak, the hate that is in her voice and the fear that is in her voice when she says that for the first time yeah. in the movie, I feel like really shows how disgusted yeah. they are with what Harry is and, what, with what, be, and yeah. what he could be and really disgusted that they're, that that exists and that they have to have a part in it. Yeah. Oh, that, yeah. The disgust is huge. Yeah. Like they would, she would rather just live their life with their one son and like mm-hmm. not have to ever consider that there's a magical world out there. Mm-hmm. And I wonder if they would be so, They the way they idolize Dudley, I wonder if they would idolize him so much if he didn't have the counterpart of Harry. You know what I mean? Because they really have split the way they treat those boys. Mm-hmm. And I wonder if he'd be so, like, on this pedestal and spoiled if it wasn't as a reaction to Harry. You know what I mean? I wonder if that, like, got pumped up over the years and then he got more and more spoiled. Because Yeah, because how – aren't they similar in age? They're the same age, I think. They're going so to. They're, they're going, the same, both going to school, right? So if they're the same age, then they were both babies at the same time, which yeah. means there was a period of time where they had, where she probably, right? I don't know if the dad does a lot, 
that she was taking care of both of the babies at the mm-hmm. same time because they were both would have been really little and yeah. how and what did that look like yeah i mean it also could just be their attitude towards harry could just be like it's shitty but just feeling put upon that they had to take care of this kid yeah and not really growing up out of that and just continuing to feel resentful, even though they don't seem like they're struggling for resources at all. I mean, they spoil the fuck out of Dudley. Oh, and right. that money could be going towards Harry as well. And it didn't seem like they would be struggling if they split the resources between the two boys. Absolutely. Because it's not like they were, like, barely feeding Dudley. And then they also had to feed Harry. Clearly not. Yeah. They were, you know, they seemed fine. They were well-dressed. They had good food. Like, they were entertaining in their house. You know? Oh, Yeah. And giving him, like, what, 37 presents or some shit? <laughs> yeah, a whole lot. And like, he was so spoiled. Yeah. <laughs> so spoiled. Um, and Only 37? I mean, I literally... last year? I literally wrote Dudley, sociopath, question mark, in my notes. Yeah. Which, I mean, I don't like to say that about a child because they are children. And so they're also just reacting with, like their instincts and like you know they're not like that manipulative yet right. at that age well and also just reacting to the environment that they're set up in i mean dudley is set up in an environment where he is the star he is the golden child he is the mm-hmm. best and harry is the worst harry is the black sheep and harry is the one that yeah. all of the problems rest on and mm-hmm. all the reasons why everything bad happens and mm-hmm. dudley is only seen as this kind of golden light i mean i don't i can't imagine a kid not having an yeah. ego struggle being mm-hmm. in that environment and also being modeled that the way you treat people is conditional the respect you have for people is conditional like you can just treat people like shit just because you feel like it because yeah. he hasn't seen a reason oh, either why his parents would treat harry the way that they do no no he doesn't know any different and he just and then it shows that it's okay to bully oh for sure because mm-hmm. i I, I might be wrong, but I think they send Dudley and Harry to different schools, too. Oh, well, they're, no, they're sending Dudley to some fancy-ass school where he's wearing that stupid hat and that, like, little uniform. Right. And then they were sending Harry off to, I guess, whatever the local public is, is my assumption. Yeah, that's right. what it seemed like. Right, so they're already creating, like, a, a class establishment yeah. between yeah. Harry and uh, Dudley, where they're showing that, you know, like, you're better than Harry, and it's okay to treat people that you're better than, like, dirt. Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, they are just, I mean, they're pretty one-dimensional people. Yeah. They're very much written and portrayed in the movie as just, like, these people are villains. They're very clearly villains. Like, they don't really have a lot of depth. I guess the only kind of depth you could give them is that they might be acting out of fear, you know, about Harry. Yeah. But still, to treat a child that way. But I've also worked with families where... Because of the fear or trauma or abuse that the parents have gone through, they've projected that onto the kids in their life and kind of treated these kids, projected a lot of deep feelings onto the children and treated the children with those deep feelings that the kids did not deserve. Yeah. Or earn. Well, it makes me wonder how it was in Petunia's family with Lily. Like, I wonder was, if Lily was if was Lily the considered the spo- the special golden child, and Petunia was considered kind of not special and just do whatever we don't care. We're playing with Lily today. Like if that's why, because and Harry unfortunately gets that in a couple of different ways, right? So if he gets it from, he could possibly get it from the Dursleys because of her the mother's experience, and then he also gets it from Snape because of Snape's um, relationship with his dad. Yeah. I mean, I think what's a shame in this movie, like you're saying, is that there's an example of a lot of grownups taking out their own histories with people onto these children that have not earned it. But I mean, but that's not atypical. Like, I mean, where I grew up in the Midwest, like I, I would hear adults talk shit about kids because their mom was a single mom who had them in high school. You know what I mean? Like that kid's a bad kid because her mom had her in high school. You know what I mean? So that's also not an atypical thing to do, unfortunately, is to glom traits onto a child or guilt or shame or reputation onto a child because of what you perceive about their parents or what their parents have done to you. I mean, it's all just (laughs) wildly immature. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. And just not dealing with your own issues and projecting them all out. So how hard and kind of interesting it would be for harry to go from being in this setting where he's 
despised and neglected mm-hmm. and is uh, they're ashamed of him and he can't do anything right to being a celebrity. Yeah, it's a huge yeah. shift. Like to- in this other world where he is the most in most some people's eyes the chosen one, the a very powerful wizard and like all of these things that he has no idea about. Mm-hmm. And I mean, like the first thing he—I mean, I wrote down the first thing he says when I think he gets told that he's a wizard is, "I'm Harry. I'm just Harry." Yeah, because his narrative, as we like to say, his identity is just being like a nothing. Right. He's he's totally believes himself a nothing, and he has trouble accepting or even processing that he is something special. That he is. Mm-hmm has an identity that has value let alone being like a celebrity and a hero to an entire world of people he didn't know existed and also i mean i think too like as far as i was there any pictures of his parents that he saw before hagrid gave him that picture i don't think so because also part of it too which is the identity issue and the depth of him being feeling like nothing is he doesn't even have his parents identities or images, or probably knows nothing about them besides negative stuff that Petunia might have said. Right. To identify himself with, to align himself with. Cause a lot of us learn who we are by finding attributes in our parents that we see in ourselves, and that is like usually the first way we form our identity. And so he has nothing, well, besides negative stuff, but I feel like probably even then they probably didn't talk about his parents that much, period, besides a flippant remark here and there. That's right, to, what call, it, to call them freaks. Yeah. Right. But right. there's, he probably doesn't know what they look like. Because I think a big impact on him, which they say a lot in the movies, is how much he looks like both of his parents in different ways. And how that seems to really mean a lot to him. Yeah. Because they always say he looks exactly like his father, but has his mother's eyes. Is that yeah. kind of, that's what they always say about him, right? Yeah, yeah. that's what they always say. Mm-hmm. And also just also wanting to have all of the information that he could possibly have. Mm-hmm. Like, he really, I think part of why it means so much to him is because he doesn't have anything to go on he doesn't have anything that he can have hope about about his parents like Mm -hmm. it might even be where he doesn't even think about them or fantasize about them like maybe a child right it's just blank it's just this blank kind of dark area is how i think of it well and then it also is translated over into his social development because i don't think he has any friends oh no not until you know he meets ron and then later hermione yeah i mean i i get that he I assume he had to have gone to school legally, but it doesn't seem like he right went to school. I know. I was <laughs> just thinking I mean? that it seems too. like he was just like kept in the house until eventually he had to go to school. Like that's just I mean, I guess they do take him to the zoo and he talks to that snake. That's so awesome. But you know, he does seem like he doesn't have any friends to speak of. Like he doesn't get out. Of, it doesn't seem like he gets out of the house and sees friends. No, which I mean, at, at that age, particularly if you're not going out and hanging out with people and doing things and part of the social structure, uh, even if of the street or whatever, like I don't think he would be included in anything because he'd always be like, "No, I can't go. I can't go," and kids are going to stop asking. Mm-hmm. So I, I imagine he's pretty isolated until mm-hmm. Hagrid shows up, and all of a sudden, like he's. And brings him a birthday cake and tells him he tells him that he's a wizard. That yeah. he's special. He or... does magic in front of him. Like he's never seen magic before. He does he's magic in front of him. He's got a lot of money now. Yeah, it finds out that he's rich. I mean, it which... also makes sense why then he becomes such good friends with literally the first people he meets, which is yeah. Ron and Hermione. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. The first people that show he him imprints some like a baby duck. Oh, and, and Haggard, too, because his relationship with Haggard, even though we find out that Haggard is sort of a, a, a marked person, he's been socially ostracized for mm-hmm. what we find out about in movie two, but, like, he being so, like, put into his own class where only, like, Dumbledore and Harry seem to have a sense of value towards him, but Harry globs onto him immediately. Mm-hmm. It definitely seems like everybody that means a lot to Harry... Throughout the whole books, he meets in, like, the first half hour of the movie. <laughs> yeah. Arguably. Yeah. I mean, Dumbledore, McGonagall. I mean, they're also just big parts of the movies anyway. Like, right. they would be important anyway. But he definitely, his truest touchstones, socially, attachment-wise, seem to be the people that he meets in the very beginning of being introduced into the magical world. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And he gets very ride or die for them very immediately as well. Oh, very quickly. Can mm-hmm. I just say, like, Richard Harris was exactly who I pictured in my head when I was reading the books when I heard Dumbledore? Mm-hmm. Like, exactly. 
I mean, agree to disagree. Uh, here's my thing. I think I love Gambon's, the second Dumbledore, so much. And I like, we were talking about this when we were watching the movies, me and Last Hannah. Night. And I think I love his whimsicalness. They do definitely have a very different vocal performance. Oh, for sure. But I can't, I feel like also I read the first book so long ago, I can't tell you what I thought Dumbledore is. Because now Dumbledore in my brain yeah. is Michael Gambon's Dumbledore. And I had watched the movies before I ever read the books. So I already had an idea of like what he would be like. I think what I really like about the way that um, the second guy plays him is that he does a really good job of having having him be accessible, but also an enigma at the same time. Like, you know that he has a lot of secrets, but you also know that he really cares about Harry. Like, he's vulnerable enough in that aspect, but he's also, like, there's so many secrets and so many reasons for Harry not to trust any adults. Right. Mm-hmm. In his life. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, and so, I mean, b- book one, movie one, uh, year one, right away, <laughs> like, one of his teachers, you know, betrays him. You know, it's got the Voldemort in Quirrell. the back of the head. yeah. And so there's an immediate, like, oh, I can't trust another adult. Well, and Snape, too. Like, everybody yeah. is so nice to Harry and welcoming to her. And some McGonagall, ought to feel like, treats him just like any other kid. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then Snape is down on him immediately, like, busting on him and mm-hmm. embarrassing him in class. and I feel like straight up trash, in yeah. my opinion. Yeah. And I mean, I'm sure that's going to ruffle a lot of feathers, but I will stand by that opinion. Um, and then I think kind of tying back to what we talked about with identity and not really knowing his parents at all. Yeah. I think that's why in this movie they have the mirror of Izzered, I think is how they say it. Desire spelled backwards. Mm-hmm. And he gets so obsessive about that to the point that I think that's why Dumbledore moves it. Well, yeah. he moves it because I think it was part of like the quirrell plot. Yeah. But I also think part of it is like, Harry keeps going back to it because I think it's the first time he really gets to like not just see his parents but see him now with his parents and kind of yeah. seeing how they are as a family unit exactly. and I can't imagine how seeing himself, comforting that would feel yeah seeing himself as a son of Lily and James Potter he, he probably just sits in front of it and just like fantasizes about I know his parents and their life together right and what his life would have been and also you imagine how this has to have created kind of like an imposter syndrome in Harry because like he's lived his whole life assuming that he's trash and then now everybody but Snape Mm -hmm. tells him that he's not Mm -hmm. whereas Snape is like your father was trash and you're trash like him Mm -hmm. I mean Harry is wildly well adjusted for emotionally for his background you know you you would think that there'd be a lot more lashing out or self sabotaging, or would, I, or just like mood swings and stuff. Yeah, but he doesn't really have. But I think that's a good example, which I don't know if I've ever talked about in here. Of like some kids are just naturally more resilient. I mean, it has nothing to do with being a stronger person or a weaker person. No. Some kids just can get through stuff and be quote unquote okay, or you know, or high functioning is what I would. I guess I would call Harry very high functioning. For the life he's had so far. In that he can go to school. He can make friends. He's pretty um, emotionally stable. You know, he's not waking out in class. I mean, he he takes a lot of wild chances. Yes. But he's not, like, screaming at people and getting in fights. And, like, even Draco, who was a big bully, who would, like, it doesn't escalate like it could. Absolutely. And also just thinking about how if uh, a child was in this situation in public school there's a chance that he would have gotten taken away from them or something like Mm -hmm. if he really was acting out in all the ways that he could be and Mm -hmm. the fact that he's not doing that yeah is such a and really just i think i think you're absolutely right i think it just shows that he's resilient yeah and when then we see harry too like dealing with the bullies and just kind of ignoring them like draco Mm -hmm. comes after him and draco and his little buddies and then snape is bullying him from the teacher side But we see Harry start to, like, have found a new identity where, like, I'm not trash. Like, I'm actually kind of special, and I don't have to be that. And then we see Harry, uh, when he gets introduced to Quidditch, that Mm -hmm. he's, like, found this identity. Like, like, hold on, like, here's something I'm good at. He's probably never had that in his life. Yeah. Yeah, and I wonder, too, 
because I do. This is something I noticed in the progression of these four movies is he's more and more reactive to being bullied. But I wonder if that's partially because he's becoming more and more self-assured and more and more re- ex- being able to accept that he doesn't deserve that kind of treatment. And maybe that's why he lashes out more and more. I mean, I think also part of it is just increased anger and testosterone, which we can get to when we talk about the, the older movies. But I mean, that could be part of it as well as he's getting a better sense of self and a better sense of I don't have to put up with this any longer because I mean, the probably the biggest of like long term impact of the Dursleys with him is that he takes a lot of shit lying down. Like he is mm-hmm. very like sure even does. with Draco and stuff like he he does do a decent job of ignoring it, but not necessarily ignoring it because he's healthy, ignoring it because he's used to it. Yeah. And he's used to getting shit on. Yeah. And so what's the point of fighting back, you know? And so that could be why when the movies progress, he does get more aggressive. Yeah. Or yeah. reactive. So let's look at, at Harry as he goes through this. So what are what are the key points we see in the movie, like where we start to see like identity? So we see like we see Harry get introduced to the world from Hagrid, mm-hmm. and then it moves into Diagon Alley, mm-hmm. where I think Ollivander's shop is the next like really key point where he gets the wand, where we start to find out that only one other feather from a phoenix has been given to this wand. I mean, I think that's a good example of... Does Ollivander say it was Voldemort? He does say it's Voldemort, right? Yes. I don't appreciate how much all of these grown-ass people in these movies can't are... Can't stop themselves. Can't stop themselves from saying all this stuff to this child that he doesn't need to hear. Why is every... Like, all these... Everyone keeps talking about Voldemort and how, like, it's just like Voldemort. And, and this is a kid that probably already has, like, some not great ideas about himself. So then you're going to continue to parallel him with arguably the most evil person that's ever lived. Well, and then pre- You need to hear that, is what I'm saying. <laughs> no, he yeah. doesn't. And then, like, so we go through that, we kind of see that scene where he's, like, learning that he's as special as the most notorious but evil wizard yeah. ever. And then he finds out that he was part of Slytherin and that all... Yeah. Like, any wizard who ever turns dark, so he gets this predisposition against Slytherin, which is... I think like, putting kids into like different houses based on personality type is probably not a great move in general because it's yeah. going to create like a clan like um, mm-hmm. community amongst them, like a tribal thing where they're going to compete against each other and try. And they make the kids compete against each other for the house cup every year, mm-hmm. but they create this like, well, you're good enough to be part of this house, and you're. And then you see Harry without knowing anything about Slytherin or how Slytherin could help him. I guess it's shitty that with the hat. Right? I guess yeah. it's shitty that there is a of the four houses. There is a house that is just kind of known as where all the assholes go. Like, yeah, that's not absolutely. a great. I mean, they seem to like Draco seems to take great pride in being part of Slytherin, and I know that a lot of people, even in like. Are, like the real world who take the test like there are some people who like being Slytherin and stuff but like it is kind of crazy that just for the development of kids and their identity to yes. have a house that is so like I think in like maybe like the second or third movie McGonagall even like says like when she's giving the history of the second movie when she's giving yes. the history of the Chamber of Secrets and she's like yes there are three ones that founded were like good people who loved everybody and then that asshole Slytherin is a piece of shit it's like it's yeah. like if they were like it's like word for word her speech <laughs> like right just there. pretty much I mean <laughs> it all it's crazy to think that they respected if that founder was so evil Hitler-esque yeah that they would still give him a house just because he helped found the place I think that'd be one of those things that they were like he used to have a house but he was kind of trash and so now there's just three houses yeah because i think it, it, it would fuck with kids identities in terms of all the kids are going to slytherin well the fact that harry literally doesn't know anything about this world and already knows that he doesn't want to be slytherin right like yeah. right. that is that means that that has a huge impact yeah on kids who are getting sorted i mean even like i remember I remember when I read the books about how scared he was about the sorting hat because Mm -hmm. he didn't understand what it was. He knew that he would get put in a place where he might have to stay for a long time. He doesn't understand how anything works. He was really scared to be like he didn't know what it meant, but to already Mm -hmm. know that he didn't want to be Slytherin because of what they're telling him and what he's experiencing. Like, Yeah, that creates a lot of bias. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For sure. Which I think kind of, I mean, sliding into movie two, 
I mean, a movie too, it, like I just brought up, like it really talks about Slytherin as the other in that movie. Cause mm-hmm. they're also talking about the concept of well, racism, which is mud bloods, which is the racist term for muggles or people who aren't a hundred percent from pure. wizard blood. Right. Is it wizard people blood? aren't pure magic blood. born Ma- magic pure. born. I think they say pure blood or pure born. Pure blood. No, mm-hmm. pure blood. Pure blood and mud blood. <laughs> oh, they go. It's too boring. Is that what it Podcast is? Podcast over. <laughs> Come on, uh, Br- Brittany. You're supposed to be the Ravenclaw of the group, okay? Well, you know what? Slytherin over there. You can get off the uh, butt about it. Yes. <laughs> I guess we could also say I'm a Ravenclaw. I'm a Slytherin. I just found out. <laughs> I am a Hufflepuff. Exactly. Um, and so... In the second movie, there's a lot more of that divide of mm-hmm. us versus them. And I think that's Absolutely. kind of like, I guess we would say the psychological morality tale in that movie is learning how to be accepting, you know, learning about racism, you know, because mm-hmm. they're 12, they're 12, 12. And so yeah. it's kind of also at the time in your life and your development where you can think abstractly and kind of understand concepts like social groups and the us and them mentalities and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And Empathy. F- fun fact, reading Harry Potter actually makes kids more able to be sympathetic towards people of different backgrounds and to have mm-hmm. better tolerance for diversity and less tolerance for bullying based on that. Mm-hmm. Yep. Absolutely. Because it's also the introduction of the Malfoy family, Draco's parents, and getting a real feel for those pieces of shit <laughs> well and i think what i think is really interesting about the malfoys and what i kind of wrote down in my notes is it's a clear example of how bullies don't come from a vacuum draco is the way draco is becomes he, because he comes from a toxic family yes. like i think a lot of times when we think about bullies or like the evil kids in movies there's always this very one-dimensionalness about them like that kid's just a dick yeah and i think what the movie does really well and what it continues to do over the course of all the movies is give Draco a lot more depth and that in this movie, you're really getting the first glimpse of seeing why he is the way he is, which is he's from a family where you are encouraged to, to judge others, encouraged to bully others, you know, constantly having to assert your power by shitting on other people. And there's probably a lot of conditions around the love in that household. Oh, I'm sure there are tons. Yeah. And also growing up seeing that it's okay to abuse others who are different with the way they treat the house elf. Absolutely. Yeah, like Dobby, yeah, correct. Oh, Dobby. Which, another fun nerd fact here is <laughs> that uh, there's actually a psychological effect named after uh, Dobby the elf called the Dobby effect, named for people who... And I'm sure we've seen people like this in our life who struggle with making mistakes and overcorrecting themselves to the point that they may feel the need to punish themselves for making a mistake. And It's like an extreme level of neuroticism. Yeah, it is, but that now has a name that is that the Dobby is effect. Very. A bunch of friggin' nerds thought that up and named it <laughs> that. I mean, I don't, <laughs> I, mean yeah. I don't know how many research psychologists you've met, but... Uh, most of them They're that like, I know. I'm so excited to discover this thing and call it this. They, they can <laughs> they'd probably fit in your house. <laughs> but I do think what I like about the Malfoys as an idea is that, and why it gives me a lot of empathy for Draco, yeah. is that I'm sure there's a lot of very more subtle, internalized abuse in that household. Absolutely. Where, oh, of course. Where they, I wouldn't be surprised if Draco gets smacked around every once in a while. Oh, I yeah. wouldn't be surprised if he gets shit on a lot as much as he's probably also like touted like yeah. praised it's probably very like we only love you if you do this or if you win this or you know and or if you betray yeah. our family in a certain way right yeah. i mean like don't living embarrass up, us don't embarrass us like the the intensity with which his father speaks in the movies and how angry he gets with harry the one time and his I, disdain yeah i mean he is fucking terrifying he is evil he is evil like he's a straight up evil motherfucker like this dude is bad and he like Knowing that, I can't imagine what it must be like for Draco in that household. Because if he is like that with Harry, who technically he's never fucking even met before, Mm -hmm. what is he like with his own son? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that's what, like, when dealing with characters like Draco and working with kids that are, like, angry like that and are (laughs) mean to other kids like that, a way that I used to find empathy is, 
I try to remind myself and remind other people, like, people who act like Draco are not happy people, and they don't come from happy homes. Like, happy right. people do not act that way. No, and he has to validate himself by surrounding himself with people that are lesser than him, like Crab and Goyle. Yeah. yeah. And he doesn't seem to mind, like, he makes that comment, like, that he d- didn't know that one of them could read. Yeah. Because it's like, it is. he doesn't care if they're... Is into, I mean, he probably prefers that they're not his intellectual equals because Draco doesn't seem stupid himself. No, no he's not. not at no. all. Yeah. No, no, no. He and so that he them. chooses to kind of have two like subservient lackeys instead yeah. of like true We just friends. kind of follow him around like puppy dogs. Which is probably what his dad's like. I bet his dad walks around alpha dogging like an asshole and like doesn't have any equals yeah. in his mind that he like has around because it's all power stuff. Other as than well. Cornelius Fudge, the Minister of Magic. And sure. any other Death Eaters. But yeah, no, he's like walks around like it's all he's control. king shit. Yeah. yeah. You know, and so when you have to be in control all the time, you can never be in like satisfying relationships because that involves give being, and take and re- vulnerable. vulnerability and reciprocity that if you need to be in control all the time, you, you never will have. have. Yeah. So what about Gilderoy? I feel like he's somebody <laughs> yeah. we have to talk about here from the psych <laughs> standpoint. We have to talk about Gilderoy. He's such a perfect cartoon version of someone with narcissistic personality disorder. So Gilderoy Lockhart, for those who might not remember, he is like the, he kind of looks like a Prince Charming-esque cartoon from a movie. Yeah. Like he's very over the top. He writes a bunch of books. All the ladies swoon over him. He's very flouncy and like, ha-ha kind of energy all the time. And he becomes their defense Defense against, defense against the dark yeah, arts. Yeah, and he just, he's so textbook narcissist personality disorder in such a funny, interesting way. Like, he is very deluded mm-hmm. about his sense of grandeur. By that I mean, like, he oh, thinks he's so a bigger grand. a bigger dude than he is. And more powerful, too. Like, and he, like, thinks that he's very good at all of these charms, and look at all these things I can do, and then when he gets into the... I think when he he brings out the Boggart, right? No, Boggart's the third one. He brings out the fairies. Oh yeah, he releases that yeah. that cage of fairies. The fairies. He does he the fairies, out. and then he can't handle them, and he runs away. And he runs away, and leaves all these children in this room. Right. God bless Hermione. Right, and then then he yeah. gets into the the duel with Snape, and then makes it look like when he gets his ass whooped that like. He was just demonstrating. I mean, he continually puts the children in really in unsafe danger. positions. Yeah. Because he can't get out of his own asshole. Yeah. Which, I mean, that's part of why he's the more cartoony version, because he's also in this fantasy world. Yeah. But in more real life, what it is, is you kind of just keep making over-the-top statements about yourself and your abilities and your skills that aren't true. And also straight up lie which he does do a lie to about your achievements lie about your worth in situations like how it would look more in like real life would be i'm the top salesman at my job everyone knows that they can't make a sale unless i'm involved with it and everyone just loves me and praises me for how good of a salesman i am and maybe no one at the office gives a shit about him or maybe he has only made like maybe one or two sales Mm -hmm. like it's this very like built up idea in their brain about who they are because they need a constant validation from the outside world absolutely and he when the pressure gets on him he finally admits that his real skill is a memory charm with stealing other people's Mm -hmm. uh memories and then taking them for himself so he's such like a he has demonstrates at the last second like this awareness of narcissism that you don't typically see where they like manipulate others and admit doing it yeah like a true Mm -hmm. narcissist would probably never see their uh, they they're, would never, yeah, they would never acknowledge. About it. No, never had never insight ne- about it. Never. Yeah. That's the good word I'm looking for. There's the psych term of the day: insight. insight. Well, and insight. I would also Today say, is brought to you by insight. <laughs> and I would say that he, he does. He's a good example of narcissist in that he can't stop believing in what he's believing, even when he's in yeah. peril, even when other people are in peril. Like it's because there is this terrifying when I've like worked with people with it or seen it from outside of it there is this they like need there's this huge fear of letting go of that identity even when it's hurting them even when it's damaging their relationships even when it's like breaking down everything in their life they're they are so attached 
to the identity and needing that identity and needing whatever that identity means to them and having to be a big deal and all that stuff that it's like the last thing they're able to let go. They really have to hit rock bottom to let it go, which he kind of does in this movie, but it is a good example of, because every I imagine a lot of people watching this movie would be like, why can't he just let it go? Because it's like getting really bad. Why does he keep going? It's getting so bad. It's getting worse and worse. But yeah. that is a probably one of the most realistic portrayals of it is that he keeps hanging on to this behavior and this mindset, like until the bitter end. Even and then he and then he lashes out at these children angrily for forcing him to lose that identity, which mm-hmm. is also pretty typical of someone dealing with narcissistic personality disorder is when that cha- personality gets challenged, Yep, you know, to lash out right. in anger. So what about Tom? Tom. When we get introduced to Tom Riddle. Voldemort. Voldemort. I mean, we could do a whole podcast about what that fucker's deal is. Like, the... N- Ugh, I feel like I don't even know how to start this without going off for the next half hour. Like, yeah, it, I mean, because we don't know at if we're going to talk about these movies in a vacuum, right, right? These first four, we don't know a lot yet about his parents and all that backstory. Because that's like book five or six or movie five or six. That's not until six. Yeah, is about the like his parents. It's about how Dumbledore that meets dynamic, them, right? Where he comes from, how he's treated. So, I mean, that's something we could probably talk about for a half hour in itself when we get to that movie. But, I mean, he's definitely a clear example of someone who also has narcissistic issues. I don't even know if I would... I mean, it is entitlement and narcissism, but I don't know. It's also antisocial. Yeah, I would say he's more antisocial because he shows, like, more disdain for others. Lack of empathy, for sure. Lack of empathy, and he shows, like, an elitism, but it's not for the sake of being elite it's for the sake of being better than you yeah. and like furthering his own needs and it's a totally unearned elitism as well correct i mean i and guess he so... was like a powerful wizard but and he's really manipulative like even yeah like with well i guess that's way later in the movies but he so i mean he just shows all of those characteristics so much. Well, even in this movie, he manipulates Jenny. He manipulates mm-hmm. Harry via the diary. Like, yeah, he's it's all end game. Like he switches on a dime. How he betrays himself in that movie. Yeah. And ugh, I mean, he's just out for him 100 percent for sure. And he's the one that's behind Hagrid getting expelled, even though it had nothing to do with Hagrid. It was him. Well, I mean, it's the I mean, I think ugh, correct he, me if I'm wrong, but uh, one of the criteria for antisocial is like treating people like a means to an end absolutely and so he is the example like he doesn't see people right he sees no circumstances he sees pawns he sees ways to methods like he doesn't see humans that have lives and feelings and consequences to his decisions no not at all and like he opens the chamber of secrets and people getting killed was his fault Mm -hmm. because he's a parcel mouth so he can yeah, talk to snakes. Talk to snakes, which means he can open the chamber, and then he gets kids killed, mm-hmm. and they blame Hagrid. Well, and also, I mean, and he is the big proponent of all the mud blood, pure racist blood. bullshit, you yeah. know? And if, I mean, this is getting ahead a little bit, but he is half human. I mean, half muggle, right? Yes. Yeah, he's which, I mean, which prince. is also a classic example of... I mean, people always bring this up that Hitler's grandma was Jewish, but mm-hmm. it's, it's a classic like self-hatred as well that really pumps up or trying to create your own identity by doubling down hard and... against something about yourself. Yeah. And like to kind of get rid of it and to, you know, well, I mean, it's the Kylo Ren syndrome, which is you got to burn it down to build it up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. So moving on from that one, what about. The Prisoner of Azkaban. So movie three, year that, three. Year three. That's my personal favorite of the books and of the movies. It was so well done. Like, this one was almost page for page how I imagined the movie going or in my head when I was reading the book. Mm-hmm. Like, I thought this one was mm-hmm. the best done. Movie one was also quite close. Well, I would say this is the first movie that feels more grown up like where you can feel it maturing it's darker the themes are darker oh yeah Um, it's dealing a lot more with it it enters a lot of the things that i think continue on with the rest of the movies which is attachment trying to find a family and then forming attachments with adults and then either being betrayed by those attachments Mm -hmm. or um losing them 
in some way. Like, because it's the introduction of Sirius Black. Right. Which is his godfather. And the closest thing he feels like he is a father figure in terms of. Like, he gets really attached to Sirius Black very quickly, in my opinion. Yeah, absolutely. And also gets attached to, also gets attached to Dumbledore as well. And, and what I, what me and Brittany were talking about last night was that in that way, he gets attached to two men who are somewhat vulnerable, but also guarded. Mm-hmm. And how hard that will be for, how hard that would be for somebody who already struggles with attachment issues like Harry does, not really being able to have a secure attachment to his family because he was removed from them when they were, when mm-hmm. they died when he was one. And so kind of seeing that he reaches out to these people who aren't really available. Yeah, I mean, I think it's more, especially more in like movie four, where Sirius is still in his life, but he can only communicate him via fireplace ashes. <laughs> yeah. And that was a little weird. Dumbledore yeah, is was. Dumbledore is keeping a lot of secrets from him, but is also offers himself up as a very emotionally vulnerable space for Harry. Mm-hmm. It is that thing where Harry is developing a pattern of being attracted to adult role models who are only so available. Which might be his sweet spot, because a lot of kids, when they have attachment issues, tend to glom onto people who are only so available. Because there's a degree of protection there by circumstances. Mm -hmm. Like, you can only get so close because. I mean, and I think a big thing of what I noticed in this movie, the third movie, is he's a lot angrier. Like, the beginning scenes with the Dursleys, he's a lot angrier. And I don't know, and you can maybe speak to this more, Benjamin... If he is 13, he's got more testosterone pumping through him. So I don't know if part of it is just being going through puberty and just feeling angrier. Well, at 13, there's a couple things going on, particularly as having been a 13-year-old and having Mm -hmm. a a rather difficult 13th year uh, for me. Um, But the uh, thing about being 13 is that you are getting more adult-sized like, unfortunately for poor Daniel Radcliffe, his adult <laughs> size is quite small. <laughs> but uh, when I was 13, I was probably six feet. Okay, so you're, like, oh, towering wow. over all the other kids? It's like, six feet, 160, probably. So I had, like, gotten quite man-sized at that point. But mm-hmm. you develop, yeah, your, your testosterone is getting out of control, but you're also starting to look people who you thought of as adults, as powerful figures... In their eyeballs, as opposed to looking at mm. their rib cage, you know, where you're like, like, hold on, though, like, I'm like big yeah. shit now, you know, yeah. and uh, yeah. you're also having a hard time. Like, there's testosterone, your muscles are growing, you're getting bigger, you're becoming thought of more of as a man. In some cultures, you are a man uh, at that point, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. you're starting to develop the ability to do something about people doing things to you. Yeah, and so I think right off the bat, which is what I is like where I put some of that thought that I was having is because right after that, he is so much angrier with the Dursleys. Like he has that freak out towards the aunt that's visiting. Right. He freaks out on her, he runs away. He's having a lot more moments where you can see that he is struggling to rein it in. Like he's sitting in yeah. his room with like his hands clenched and he's so angry. Right. And we never saw that before within him. Like he mm-hmm. maybe would throw like a little kid fit, but like this was like this really contained fury inside of him to the point that he does fuck out. Like he like fucks off and yeah, runs away and endangers. Sh- I mean, he's only 13 still. He probably doesn't have any money. I mean, he might have magic money, but ain't going to work in the real world, like the muggle yeah, world. Right. Yeah. And so he doesn't really have resources still because the Dursleys, I'm sure, aren't giving him any. And... He he's just so much more impulsive. And I think that's a big thing I noticed in this movie as well is he's so much more impulsive and reckless. But in a way, also that 13 year olds are. And I think what I like I said earlier, what I love about these movies, especially three and four, is that he acts in the totally enraging way that a 13 and 14 year old acts, which is. Why aren't you thinking before you do anything? But anything. it's but it but it anything. is but because I what I what I <laughs> what annoys me when I watch other movies with child characters is that they will act like grown ups when they shouldn't act like grown ups yeah. or they do things that grown they like think things through in the way the grown ups would and it's like no you'd probably do more like this like even Hermione the smartest one 
she does things out of impulse like she gets all hung up on how her hair looks from behind when they're time traveling yeah you know what i mean but that is very she punches draco in the face which could get her a lot of trouble especially since he's a snitch and an asshole yeah his dad throws his dick around a lot yep like he could have easily like called his dad and his dad try to pressure them to expel hermione yeah you know which he threatens to do Mm -hmm. yeah and so they all act in a way that i think a lot of kids act when they're going through puberty which is kind of insane like they act kind of insane (laughs) oh yeah absolutely (laughs) and everyone's moodier and more dramatic and everything means so much when it shouldn't mean anything (laughs) and i appreciate that it's giving that it's letting these kid characters have these reactions yeah, I feel like they did that very authentically, and even though, like, sometimes the acting, like, it, it gets it gets better by this one, because the kids are able to, like, better understand, you know, like, yeah. what's going on. Because before, we're talking about, like, 11, 12-year-old kids, like, their yeah. acting prowess and under- understanding what they're doing is only Like, their motivations so far. and stuff. Right. Yeah. But in this one, I feel like the directing and, like, the, the darker filter they used on the cameras, like, everything had, like, a grittier, mm-hmm. darker feel to it. Mm-hmm. Um... And they also, like, they moved Hagrid's hut, like, outside of the castle. Like, to me, that, like, kind of visually represented, more, like, more being, like, an outsider and uh, it being also a bigger part of the world because, I think, before Hagrid's ca- his hut was, like, looked like it was still, like, in the courtyard of the castle, so everything was all contained within Hogwarts. And this one was the first one where they're, like, opening the camera up to where you see Hagrid's hut as part of this bigger world. And when they bring in the hippogriff in and mm-hmm. the executioner from and the minister of magic, like introducing all of this real adult consequence, everything real is big world stuff to the pump world. up, yeah. right? And then the dementors coming in, like, like scurry, scurry, scurry stuff. And I and um, oh, where's it going with this? And he he like and he I mean at one point in the movie with the impulsive stuff too, and all the stakes being higher. I mean he strikes. Snape, a teacher, with a wand. Like, he does a spell on Snape. And I know that he thinks that it's out of, like, defense for other people, but it's really because he wants to have answers. Like, it's not because anyone's in peril. It's because he wants something. And so he hits a teacher. Yeah. And that could... He could lose all of his school from that, which is his his home now and his safe place. His everything. And he doesn't think through that when he does that in that moment. I was also wondering, while you guys were talking, is... Also, maybe because he knows, because now that he has this world that accepts him and that thinks that he's special and he has friends, that he also would be losing a lot more if the Dursleys fuck with him too hard. Like, if they really stop him from going to Hogwarts, he would be devastated. Mm -hmm. And how now he has something to fight for. So I wonder if on on top of all the things that you guys pointed out, which is absolutely true, that there's also this sense of, I can't, I can't lose that. Yeah, I can't lose the ability to go to ho- to go to Hogwarts and to be in this magical place, which it makes it even crazier that he hits Snape yeah. in that moment. Well, that's the whole theme. That's like the, where the movie starts, though. Yeah. It's like he gets threatened with that by the Dursleys, which is why he leaves. Is that because Aunt, Aunt whatever her name was? No, oh, no. The, oh, the mean lady, the, the other um, one, like he the headmaster inf- from Matilda. Yeah, he inflates her with his, the magic, and so he gets in trouble for using magic outside of Hogwarts, mm-hmm. which is an expulsion offense. Yeah, like the, you know, he thinks that you know, like maybe he gets, away, he gets away with a lot of wild shit. Yeah, he, he, he thinks, really does. He thinks he's gonna get kicked out. Well, I think that's probably because this is just me speculating about the movie. Is that Dumbledore probably knows we got to keep this kid like in our care because Voldemort's gonna come after him, and also maybe recognizing too that Harry could be powerful, and if Voldemort gets him and like dark sides him. Yeah. We're all fucked. Yeah. And so I think part of why Dumbledore kind of lets a lot of things slide. One, because a lot of it happens that isn't Harry's fault. Like, right. even the stuff in the house of striking Snape, like, that's some crazy shit. Yeah. That he's, and he's 13. Yeah. But also, I think Dumbledore's probably like, we need him under our roof. And we need him on our side. Oh, and absolutely. And we need to keep him up on the up and up, up over here, where we can see him and watch him and keep him cool. I mean, I've even brought up that I wonder if that's part of why... Because they let so many other things slide for Harry that are just seem seemingly little, but they won't let him go to Hogsmeade without this signed permission slip. Like right. there's no way to get around that. Right. And I was saying to um, Brittany, I was like, I wonder if that's because they wanted to keep him on the grounds. Like oh, they wanted possible. to keep him at Hogwarts as they wanted to have a reason to yeah. make sure that he was safe. 
And I also wonder, too, with why he runs away and is so reactive to the Dursleys, is now he's spending so much more time with the Weasleys, and maybe he's actually getting a feel for what a real family feels like and what a loving family feels like, and the Dursleys are becoming wildly unacceptable. Because I think maybe a lot of why he put up with them so much, especially if he was as isolated as we think he might have been, yeah. Yeah. not going to friends' houses and stuff right. as a kid, is he might not have had any examples of what a family could feel like. And so the Dursleys, though they suck, maybe this is how it is. And now he's been in this family where Mrs. Weasley, both of them are godsend, both parents, but Mrs. Weasley, like she in the first movie, she makes him that sweater, that matches Ron's sweater. Right. Like, she really takes him under her wing and takes care of him. That's well, his first pr- present ever, yeah. isn't it? Arguably, yeah. And like, he gets, like, the broom and, the, and that yeah. sweater, like, at the same time. That's his first present. Yeah. And so, but, and also, it's a situation where he doesn't earn the Weasley's love in any regard. And so she just gives him love because he's a child and he's a good kid and she's just like, come here, and takes care of him. And so I wonder, too, if now that he's experienced that, one, he knows that he maybe could depend on the Weasleys to take care of him in a pinch. And two, that now that he knows what that's like, the Dursleys are really pieces of shit in his eyes now. Yeah. Like, you guys are monsters. Now yeah. that I know what you could be like, mm-hmm. how fucking dare you for being the way that you are. And you're are. related to me. Mm-hmm. And you can't yeah. be kind to me at all. And I think that also is something when a lot of people when you work with them in therapy and they're changing their minds about stuff usually the first kind of wave of changing your mind with something is getting really angry at mm-hmm. the things that you're noticing now that are true mm-hmm. and how it can be really hard to rein that in like a lot of times when i work with people who are changing their ideas about their families and stuff they commonly will go through a period of time where they maybe they can't be around their family because they can't rein in their anger because yeah. it's all, they're like realizing all this stuff and they're like it's kind of washing over them and their anger can't really be contained and so they create a lot of boundaries until they kind of work through more stuff and then they feel better and they can kind of be around the family more and more without like wigging out. And so it does make sense in that regard that maybe that's why he's also so much angrier with the Dursleys. Is I think Because so. he's coming, he's having a lot of revelations and epiphanies yeah. about what attachments feel like and what caring about someone really looks like and what love looks like and how dare these people treat him the way they did. Right. And then we see... On the flip side of that, we also... This is the first introduction to true betrayal. Mm -hmm. With the introduction... Because we meet... We learn that Sirius and Ramus and... Peter Pettigrew? Pettigrew were the best friends of Harry's dad. Mm -hmm. We learn, like, this was his core friends. These are the people that would have, like... Uh, in our culture, Britain's is a little different, but like in our culture, like they would have stood up at his wedding. This would have been like serious. Mm-hmm. Would have been like his best man. And yeah, like we learned that it was Pettigrew that betrayed his family's location, mm-hmm. and like this is the first a uh, time that real world consequences work their way into the world of Harry Potter, where like the betrayal and being stuck and trapped and not able to do anything about it. And knowing the truth and still having no one believe you yeah, works its way into the story, which starts to complicate it with adult themes. Mm-hmm. And I think that they, that, well, I think that it's realization also, yeah. for Harry like really starts driving his some of the paranoia he shows. Well, I mean, he continues to be shown in every movie, and it continues to escalate, that adults cannot be trusted. Adults will not take care of you. Yep. And you can't trust adults to handle the situation. No. You can't. Which is probably why he takes so many. Because I was thinking on this, like, in so many situations in books three and four, any other kid would be like, oh, shit, we need to tell a a parent or an adult and then they'll take care of it. Yeah. And Harry's first instinct is, I'm going to fucking do this myself. Like, there's several times when he'll, like, stand up to do something and Hermione will tug him down. You know what I mean? Or, like, restrain him. And... Because he's ready to jump in and handle it himself, which is every other kind of kid, especially at 13, would be like, oh, where's the nearest adult? I need an adult. To handle this for me. And I he, need his, an adult. Yeah. his instinct is not to go to an adult, which says a lot yeah. about his attachment mm-hmm. and his trust in adults. Like a ton. Absolutely. And something else that this movie does is it introduces you to depression, too. Like the, the Dementors. Like, apparently, the. Um, the author really based this, the Dementor characters on, like, her own experiences with depression. But you can tell, like, she clearly understood it. Because watching those things and, like, their description of what they do is such a insightful, to use the word of the day, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, 
depiction of what depression is like and how it feels like it sucks the very happiness away from you so you can't yeah. feel it regardless of what you do. And I thought that that was, that was a wonderful addition to this film. Like the worst punishment they come up with is sending you away to a prison where they suck happiness out of your life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But also I think Remus is a really good example of, I think, depression and guilt-based depression. Because he, I even wrote this down, like... <laughs> As a werewolf. Um, what would be the <laughs> impact on you psychologically about... Where would you put the guilt of what the things that you do when you're in wolf form? And I think he was... I remember you thinking this a lot, too, in the book. Like, that he's a really good example of someone who struggles with regulation. Like, regulating your mood. And then feeling guilt for the things that you do when you're not in control of yourself. Yeah. Because he really hates himself. More so in the books, you get that vibe yeah. that he really hates himself. Oh, yeah. yeah. Because of being a werewolf and the things that he's done. And I think that's such a powerful example for people reading the books who may have struggled for similar things. Like when I'm in my depression or in my bipolar, I do things I don't mean. I lash out. I'm angry, you know, and then I feel so shitty about it later, which feeds into my feelings of I'm a bad person. And then it becomes this vicious cycle of worthlessness and depression and anger and sadness and you know on and on and on yeah and you see some of like that same type of sense like there's there's so many parallels and like reverses in this movie like Hermione's almost like the opposite of that where like in order to feel validated like she has to take so many classes that it's not physically possible yeah I don't think that was responsible of those adults to give her that thing so that she could take multiple classes oh time turner no yeah, yeah if they were really like emotionally intelligent teacher the response shouldn't have been oh yeah i'm gonna help you with this problem it should have been like hey girl why do you feel like you need to take twice yeah. as many classes as your uh peers what's that energy about what girlfriend about this? <laughs> what about this feels like you have to take all these classes right now yeah what what is making you feel what clearly, is making this feel urgent they don't show it as much in the movie but in the book she like is really moody and burnt yeah. out and like run ragged by right. doing this before even all this drama happens just yeah. like throughout the book she's kind of non-existent almost yeah because she is fatigued <laughs> and like yeah. not hanging out not acting like a kid like she's kind of a mess in this book yeah, yeah. she doesn't in the book not so much the movie but in the book she's definitely like yeah. fatigued right yeah and like she doesn't have as much screen time in this one either yeah because she's not around and i and they don't really I can't remember. I read the books when I was like 14. I mean, these early ones. Right. But they never really get into the meat of that. Like why she felt the need. They might have in the book, but why she felt the need to like push herself so hard. And we kind of talked about a little bit like, I don't know if it's because she is muggle born and maybe she feels the need to prove herself or because she just literally loves school and it's a way to make her feel good because she's kind of socially awkward and they don't really do this in movies, but not very attractive in the book, she's they make a lot about talking about how she's not very attractive. Like she's very plain and very got big ass teeth, right? And crazy. And her ass hair. hair is wild, and, yeah. And also, and she's uh, not very well liked, right? <laughs> and well, because she's kind of a know it all, yeah. And and I think one of the things that I notice is it seems like it's just easier for her to connect with books than it is with people, mm-hmm. for her. And that's something that she really s- succeeds at. And so because of that, she doesn't mm-hmm. have an interest in doing anything else. And it might be because she's also turning 13 and having yeah. a lot of feelings and maybe feeling attracted to the gender she's attracted to and probably getting her period <laughs> and all that stuff. That maybe that's why she doubles down on the book learning is because she's having a lot of feelings and doesn't know where to put them and doesn't want to deal with them. Yeah, I think that's probably dead on. And like the the last point I want to make about this movie before we talk about four so I know we could really probably have done a podcast on each of those, and maybe if this goes well and you guys want more, that could be something if we get a bunch of requests for and we might revisit. But with um, with this movie, the concept of the Patronus, I think, is such an important thing that, from a psych standpoint, we have to talk about. And yeah, like the, Mine's a hummingbird. What's your guys's rabbit? A big, fluffy, hairy dog. That is of mine. Of course it is. A Newfoundland. A big Like a real dog. Hufflepuff. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever, Brittany, okay? The only reason you know it's so Hufflepuff is because you're so Ravenclaw, you probably sat and read about it. Oh, I can see. <laughs> Listen, I can look at a person from a mile away and tell you what their house is, all right? 
I almost never. You wronged. wouldn't have guessed that I was Slytherin. I mean, now that I know, it makes sense. Oh my god. Okay. <laughs> okay. I didn't, you, you, I didn't, so you're going to reject okay. that, but I had the same response. Yeah. Well. Because you do whatever the fuck you want. Fine. It's been, it's been hard times there, here over the podcast see? for Hannah since she found out she's Slytherin. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah. But the anyway, the Patronus, because that's a whole other thing we can get into yeah, for agreed. like a we long can, time. Yeah. Uh, we could talk about the personality types and like who's mm-hmm. uh what who what four letters make up who you are. Right. Right. We right. We would not right, do that right, right. now. Um, but the the Patronus, I, I thought, was so powerful because it kind of illustrated to people, and probably how she figured out how she got out of her own depression. Uh, J.K. Rowling, uh, what I mean by that is she, because there's two, it's either she or Hermione's, but it, I mean her. Uh, she got out of her depression by creating this world, creating Harry Potter, finding the thing that means the most to her, that gave her joy that she dug deep for and committed to. And the only way to beat the Dementors is to dig deep within yourself and find the thing that makes you happy and feel whole and to use that to project into this weapon against these things. I thought that was an awesome message. I mean, it's a good, it'd be a cool thing to do in treatment, which we could talk about more later, of using that as um, a metaphor when doing treatment with people. Fun fact, in EMDR, you certainly do that right at the start. Mm-hmm. I think the last thing that I think notice in book th- and movie three that I think is significant is how quickly Harry um, puts all his hopes and dreams onto Sirius. And like, I'm going to live with Sirius so and fast. he's going to take care of me and we're going to be like a family now. Like all he knows about this dude is that he was a prisoner in Azkaban for a bajillion years and that he knew his parents growing up. Like... Sir- and Sirius is so angry in front of him and so impulsive and so not safe acting. Yeah. That, I mean, he is it's scary. Like, it's almost like I would argue. Oh, yeah. He's, yeah. he's yeah. wild. Yeah. I would argue that Harry isn't responding to Sirius. He's responding to the idea of Sirius. Yes. And the fact that Sirius is the closest he'll ever get to his dad. Because he's best friends cl- with his dad. Right. And right. closest he'll ever get to somebody who is magical that he can be connected to. Yeah. Because he, and and that's not any typical, like, kids I've worked with who are adopted or fostered or whatever, or don't live with their birth parents, mm-hmm. there can be a lot of magical thinking about the parent that you're not around or about your other options, and thinking that if I'm with that person, everything will be okay, because you don't know anything about them, and so it's easy to glom on to them a fantasy about how things would be, which I think is exactly what Harry does. He like he because because I mean like think about it. Sirius is a fugitive. He probably has no money. He can't right? take care of you. He is dirty and crazy a little bit and a little nutty just from being in prison. And Harry acts like if they go live together, it's going to be like leave it to Beaver or something. Yeah, like yeah. it doesn't make any sense what Harry's saying exactly. when you really think about it. Well, and also no. I think finding any way that he can get away from the Dursleys, a hundred percent. Oh, absolutely. Which... No matter even if his only option is an ex. Um, criminal. Although he was falsely accused. He was. But he's now But become, yeah, like, marked. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that can lead to such a big problem with identity. And it's fortunately Sirius goes like, hey, man, that's, that's not really realistic mm-hmm. right now. Yeah. Um, let's be real here, because just because you see the truth and other people see the truth doesn't mean the world's going to believe a 13-year-old wizard. Yeah. And I, mean, I think he also, says something pretty similar to that. He does. And also, I mean, and what we learn, if we're going to slide into book four, movie four, God, I'm going to keep saying that. Movie <laughs> it's four. Fine. It's, it's fine. Okay. It's fine. Me. It's okay. Year four is that he doesn't get to live with Sirius, which you think would have a lot more emotional impact on him. Because we don't, what I notice is movie four does not start with what it usually starts with, which is him the summer the at the Dursleys. We don't see that at all. No. Because I would anticipate he would be a mess at yeah. the Dursleys because he probably gave his hopes up about living with Sirius. He's not living with Sirius because Sirius is on the run or whatever. He's in hiding. And so now he has to go back to the Dursleys, especially after like, I just feel like I, there's no way he's not like an out of control mess yeah. at the Dursleys in terms of anger. And yeah. so it is interesting that we don't see that at all. And I don't know if that was just a directing choice because they wanted to start the movie differently than they have in the other three. You know, to not make to make sure it's not super formulaic. Mm-hmm. But right. I think from a therapist standpoint, it would be really interesting to see how he was presenting at the Dursleys that summer yeah. after being given this glimmer of hope about a different life. And especially after running away from them in a fit of anger the summer before. Yeah. 
Absolutely. And he's only getting older and bigger and more full of testosterone. <laughs> yeah. Right. So we see, like, with this movie, this starts almost immediately with the arrival of the other schools. Right? Yeah, pretty much. Yes. Yes. I think the first time like we the see... Like the opening it, ceremony at the, for their first meal together. And we see the, 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 the big ship and yeah. the flying uh, carriage come in. Mm-hmm. And I think like, what makes this movie interesting to do is there's so much development and growth in the kids where we see like, oh, now it's like high school. I love it so hard. I think when I was watching the movie with Hannah last night, I was like, I fucking love that these kids are all such goddamn messes. Because right? it's so, it's four- so, it's so 14. It like, is. the whole fit that Hermione throws at the end at Ron, which is really crazy. Like, when she's just like, you don't get anything. I'm just trying to have a good dance. And you're such a brick. And, like, he doesn't really do anything that makes why she's like, she, her fit is, like, over the top. And all I could think was, is this girl started her period? And this also my other thought was, <laughs> this is why when you're 14, you need to have girl girl friends. friends when you're a girl. Because you're starting your period, you're liking, well, possibly liking boys, depending on your orientation. But I'm trying to, I don't want to be gender exclusive. But Well, feeling you, attracted to other people. And just trying to figure out gender. your body, you're getting boobs, like, yeah. you know. And especially with her in the book version of her, her whole appearance changes. They don't really do that in the movie, which is disappointing. Yeah. But so there's also this like she's getting attention from boys in a way that she wasn't before and just hormonal and just I can't imagine. I mean, I had a lot of brothers. And so because of that, I had a lot of female friends because I had enough of that sausage at home. Yeah. And I can't imagine going through all the changes at 14 and only having dudes around me. It yeah. makes me insane. I would be like her. I would probably have these freak outs where I screamed at them for no reason yeah. and just shoved them and been like, get the fuck out of my face. Like, I would just freak out on them all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And then, like, she... And they are being assholes. They are. And, <laughs> and she did another thing that's actually, like, I mean, like, typical to see sometimes with girls that are more advanced than boys their age is she seeks out someone older and more mature even though he's a meathead like but i think he's i wish i don't know i was debating if i thought maybe she should have ended up with like a victor crumb type instead of ron but that's a real yeah we can't go we can't go down that we We can't can't, can't go down that we can talk about that that. in a later movie but i think you're exactly right ben is that also she's more mature than them She's probably she's always been intellectually more mature than them, but now she's probably also emotionally more mature. Well, I think than it's them. also fairly common for girls to be a little bit more emotionally mature yeah. at this age. Oh yeah, in some ways for sure. Oh yeah, just in general. So like even the this portrayal, I don't think is that off in that you would mm-hmm. she is a little bit more mature than that. And Ron acts surly as fuck, and that's her age appropriate. <sighs> yeah. Oh and- yeah, and she wants like wants nothing to do with it, and is like. He is also like nervous, and him and Harry like asking out girls is so accurate. Like trying oh to figure out God. like how do I figure that out? <laughs> like none of you, none of you were fourteen year old boys having to do that for the first time. Like and realizing how fucking terrifying girls are for the first time in your life. Like because mm-hmm. middle school girls are the meanest thing on the planet. Fight me, fight me. I would meanest know, thing on the planet except no for maybe house cats. <laughs> But girls, are, they just, you're mean. Girls are mean. They're mean to each other. They it's exclude. I just taught a bullying class. They are mean. They angry. exclude each other. And angry, fine. But you're like <laughs> trying to find your place in the world and fighting each other and trying to find ways to justify your fit with other girls. Boys are doing the same thing, but girls do it in different ways where boys will punch each other had, in the face. Yeah, I definitely had. It's more drama. The there. more, like more drama with other females who were older than me. Yeah. Um, But I was bossy and was like. I, like, scared a couple dudes and stuff. Because, like, I was intense. So, I... Boys weren't... I was asking out boys. And so they weren't usually the other way around. (laughs) So, and it was kind of a lot. But I definitely agree with that there is a lot of... There's so much intensity behind all of your emotions at oh, that yeah. age. And everything seems like the biggest thing that's oh ever happened. Oh, my gosh, yeah. And I, but I think what I like... And I know I'm kind of repeating myself why I so much like that in this movie and why it's something to keep in mind when you are an adult dealing with teenagers. And what I try to keep in mind when I have kid, preteen, teen clients is that those things are a big deal. And just because you as an adult know that they're that's not a big deal in the long run doesn't mean that you should invalidate it or dismiss it. 
because that i mean like social stuff and like drama within your friends and relationship stuff and breaking up and someone did this and god forbid nowadays with instagram like you didn't like my picture and all that bullshit like but that is like also how we learn how to handle conflict Mm -hmm. and to how to have issues with people that we love and to work through them is by these are all kind of like training runs for the big stuff when you become a grown-up and so it's good to treat it with the respect that that these kids feel it because everything's relative and in the little microcosm that is your 14 year old world everything is like the biggest thing that ever happened to you because also everything's happening to you for the first time and how in some ways learning how to deal with those things at those ages are is so much safer in some ways because there are so many other things outside of that that are Mm -hmm. already controlled versus Mm -hmm. a 14 year old kind of like a skirmish with girls is not that big of a deal but if you don't learn that until you're 22 at your first job and you get fired that's a lot bigger consequence than learning these things at the ages that are really where and it's the safest yeah, and you see, like, another, like, concept that starts to show itself is the difference between, like, the micro-bullying that you see between, like, the individual level of, like, Harry and um, uh, Draco fighting each other and dealing with bullying that way to where you see it, like, when Harry's name gets pulled for the goblet. Oh, kids are pissed yeah. at him. And ki- everyone is so angry at him, like, to the point where, like... Those buttons? They create buttons <laughs> and, like, magic things and, like... Even people that Harry thinks are his friends are wearing them and, like, making fun of him and thinking that, like, Cedric is awesome and, like, fuck Harry, basically. Like, Harry is a liar. He's a cheater. And... How quick they turn on him. is so hard. So hard it's because so it's like, fuck. Like, he already... Yeah. Has so much proof that he has so many different ways to have negative core beliefs about himself, to have all of this reinforcement that he is evil or a cheater or rotten in some way. It's just awful. <laughs> yeah. And, but I think it is that thing where, ugh, I mean, I, where because he is already so famous in a lot of respects and everyone knows he probably has money like that. Like, he's fucking fine. Like, you know, they're probably like, they're probably like this right. fucking prick. Like, he already is like the most famous kid and like the richest kid in the school. And now he has to do this, which is breaking all the rules because he what? He doesn't have enough attention. Like, yeah. I could see why because of that age, too, you're not very nuanced yet with things. Right. Everything's still very black and white. Like, you don't really understand the depths of people and their motivation. So at that age, in high yeah, school, you don't it's understand very easy to be. I mean, like, think about how much someone's like the bad boy or the slut. And, like, yeah. everyone is, like, labeled, and there's not a lot of symp- empathy or sympathy within that because you're just you're thinking so concretely still about yeah. who someone is. Absolutely. Right. And what's sad about this one is that we see Ron turn on Harry. Yeah, but I get it. <laughs> I get it. And the, here's the thing. Here's my little spiel, and I get it if you guys don't, you know, agree with me. But mm-hmm. I think that Ron comes from this big family. And Ron's also, like, the second youngest but he's also the youngest boy. And so there's nothing really quote unquote special about him within the family. Cause Jenny's younger than him, but she's the first girl. So I'm sure she got a lot of like, almost like first child energy towards her. And so he's already in a family where everyone's kind of all over each other, walking all over each other, talking all over each other. He gets hand-me-down clothing. He's poor. You know, there's a big part and the, there's a little scene in the beginning of the movie where he's trying to buy candy off the trolley. Right. And he goes, oh, I only have, well, never mind. I only will take one thing. And then Harry jumps in and is like, I can buy it for you. And he's like, no. And so I think there's probably a lot more awareness within him about how poor he really is. And like at that age, you're trying to figure out who you are and already feeling kind of like you're only one of many in your family. And then your best friend being like the chosen one. And so continuing to just kind of be like next to the person that's important or the person that's getting all the attention. It's never you. And so, and then the wizard cup thing happens and, you know, and I could just see where at that age when you're already surly and trying to figure out who you are and you probably have all this stuff from your childhood kind of coming up to the brim, you know, and feeling more of the social impact of being poor and having hand-me-down clothes and being made fun of that because you're trying to be attractive to the gender you're attracted to and you're trying to like learn where you are in the high school hierarchy. I could see where it all kind of kind of boils together like a perfect storm and just gets projected onto Harry. Because also Harry's a safe person for him to be shitty towards. Because they love each other. And also, they only squabble for the first, like, third of the movie before they're fine again. And he's still protecting him. Like, after the first trial, he's like, I told you about the dragons, and we're cool now, right? So it's not like that covers the whole 
you know, movie. It's just the very beginning. But I think it's a very age appropriate, understandable reaction. Oh yeah, I think it's age appropriate for sure. But I, I can see also why Harry would yet again feel abandoned and like you know, I don't, we we've covered kind of his. It's trust. all about Harry. See, we're You're all only thinking about this. Harry. We're not thinking about Ron. <laughs> I did it. Why was <laughs> not thinking? No one's thinking about Ron. Everyone's just thinking about everything impacts Harry. But I, but I mean, and I think, and I don't think that Ron. I think it's just. A product of being immature you know yeah and i don't think he was right in his choices and i think he did harry a, a bit dirty but i don't think he had the emotional intelligence to get that i think he was just i mean uh, when you're that age it's just everything that you feel is like everything that's happened to you is like the worst and so you can't see outside of that sometimes no you can't and then like we learn yet again that the defense against the dark arts teacher, which I have to admit, like, my disagreement with the writing in these stories is, like, every time it's like, I wonder who the defense against the dark arts teacher is. Like, yeah. st- I was listening to some people talk about it, and even they're like, look, I have an argument with this, is that, like, Harry Potter basically operates, especially for the first more movies, like an episode of Scooby-Doo. Like, every time I, like... Or to these pull off the mask. These meddling kids. These meddling yeah. kids. Like, yeah. And then, like, mm-hmm. even, like, Mad-Eye Moody, who seems to, like, show some more investment into Harry until, like, the end where you start to realize he's horrible is a villain. Like, Harry, like, can't trust adults again. yet again. <laughs> and, like, all other adults are Death Eaters, and we get our first introduction into, like, the actual evil of Death Eaters, where the imagery they chose to use of them I thought was interesting because they chose KKK. Yeah, it looks like I said that because it yep. looks like the robes and all that stuff. Right, yep. with, with the robes and like you like come across like the first real terror, which I would point out that I thought was irresponsible of Arthur. Uh, I th- oh, Ron's dad. Yeah, of to like to surprise Harry with like some kind of magic thing, like oh, we're just going on a trip, like just do this thing, like that's probably traumatic for Harry there, uh, Arthur. Like, you probably shouldn't do that to Harry. Like, I get what he's, like, being, like, the surprising father. Like, I'm taking my kids to something awesome, and Harry's coming, too. And, like, I'm not yeah. going to tell him we're just going to go to the World Cup. It's going to be awesome. No, but I but I think that is he's just operating as someone who's always lived in the magical world. And so, he, I mean, like, he asks Harry very rudimental questions about what the muggle world is like. So oh, he yeah. just kind of operates within, like, this is a magical world, and, like, Harry should know what's... You know what I mean? Like, he doesn't thinking about how alien it is to Harry. And if he is... He's a pretty whimsical dude, Arthur. Arthur. So I yeah. think he's probably oh, yeah. thinking. And I guess I would argue, I keep defending Ron, is that because he's from a big family and with his parents who are so like loving and supportive like they are, I bet it doesn't occur to Ron that if he ostracized Harry, that that means so much to Harry. Because Ron probably got in a I'm lot sure of it didn't. Ron's probably got in a lot of fights with his loved ones where they fight, siblings. where they don't talk to each other, and they but they feel secure because they have other people backing them up. Like it isn't this thing where every relationship is like the capital relationship in your life, right? And so he because he has his parents like. And all the family and stuff, and has had a lot of conflict with a lot of siblings. It probably doesn't mean as much to like write somebody off for a little bit. Probably not. And then like to Ron, like I mean, they're sure they see that in their family, but to Harry, that's that's everything. Mm-hmm. But, but at your age, you don't know that. Like you can't think of it like that, right? You I mean you can't. And so this movie, then there's two points in this movie before we move into treatment here, where we need to cover where shit gets real. Yeah. Because when horrible when yes. they put like. I mean, we could talk about, like, the, the Wizard Cup competition, but that's just really just kind of fantastical, fun, like, plot driving. It to... is super fun. It I is. think I like it. it. I think that's why I like the fourth book and the fourth movie so much, is it's very yeah. much like, ooh, like, we're doing a thing, and, like, it's yeah. all this magical stuff, and learning about... It's a, it explodes the world so much more. Oh, and, yeah. And learning about these other schools, and then just having these fun trials and, like, riddles and stuff. Oh, yeah. And like, it, it is one of the funnest movies in that regard. Absolutely. Yeah. Until, like, that last, that maze where, like, Ooh. they start switching yeah. and things get dark and uh, Crumb gets possessed or they get bewitched, I guess would be the word that they use. Yeah, yeah. Um, but they show, like, Moody shows you the the curses, and then you find out what actually happened to uh, poor Neville's parents, and like they traumatize Neville with that. So mm-hmm. these things start to get real about halfway through the movie, but then you go through and you see Voldemort materialize for real, mm-hmm. and Voldemort is now real, and you you find out more about Harry than you knew, like that Harry's power part comes 
from Voldemort. Mm -hmm. Like, that had to be a crushing blow to Harry. Yeah. I mean, at this age, when everyone's developing their identity and trying to figure out who they are, and he already doesn't have a foundation of identity, it's so feeble. Well, he started to buy into it now, and now he's got four years of everybody telling him he's awesome, and now he's doing well, and he's like... And he's kicking it in the... He's like killing it in the... Triwizard Cup. With kids that are three years old and more older than him. I mean, he's only had three years of school. It's a real Mary Jane in Harry Potter, you could argue. Yeah, yeah you could argue <laughs> that. Mary Sue? Is that what it is? Mary Sue, like Ray. Like, people argue that yeah. Ray in Star Wars is yeah, a Mary mm-hmm. Sue. Yeah, which it's another bullshit argument yeah. we could probably tear down. But the, um, that introduction, like, where Voldemort becomes real, and I thought Ray Fiennes is fantastic. As oh, he's, really he's so good. We talked about it. We were talking about it last night when he, we were watching. He's it. so good. It's just all the choices he makes is so. He's really good at doing so many subtle things that are very inhuman. Yeah, yeah. Like not having the nose, which probably wasn't his choice. The voice, which they did in the first movie, so that was pretty consistent. I was impressed with how consistent that was. Yeah, because yeah, that wasn't um, even him then. I don't having think. yeah, no, no, having like his fingernails and toenails be a little too long continuing to not wear shoes like the way he dresses in this weird like androgynous robe yeah. like it's all very like otherworldly in a way that's very unsettling yeah yeah and like him like informing harry that like your special power it's like your mother's love was what protected you but now what makes you special is me you know, like he's like tearing fuck. <laughs> Harry down and manipulating and fucking this whole world that Harry has believed because he's defeated Voldemort three times now, like sort of. Right. And now, like now Voldemort's, we're in the real shit. Now. We're in the real shit, and we're taking this down. And then Voldemort kills Cedric like it's nothing. Yeah, I mean they kill him pretty immediately. Yeah. As soon as he realizes that Harry there's came not alone. Kid. So then there's the guilt. Well, one, the trauma of simply witnessing a death in front of you of a peer. So that's one thing that sucks. And also someone who's very beloved and probably you looked up to and was a good... I mean, they do They suggest, do They do such a good job of this movie of continuing to reiterate that Cedric is such a good person. He never is really like... He, like, helps Harry when he can. Yeah, they show he's the Hufflepuff so, of he, him. Yeah, he's so sweet. He's, like, a true Hufflepuff in, like, the best context. And, like... And so to lose someone like that who is such a good... Like, a golden boy... And then it feeling like it's your fault. Right. And so that's the second layer of it, of it feeling like you brought this upon him and brought his death upon you, especially when you're 14. And so you think a lot more concretely like that. Right. Yeah. Everything's more black and white in those thought patterns. Yeah. And, oh God. And then the trauma of when they come back and his seeing his dad, Cedric's dad, realize that Cedric is dead. And, and his then house. Wit- and then, wit- yeah, that. That in itself would be, like, any of those things separately are traumatizing and then they all happen together and then in the crucial moment when someone could have comforted him and made him feel better he gets again traumatized by the fake mad eye moody right who already crouch jr yeah takes advantage of him and just reiterates an old trauma he has of adults are deceitful and i cannot trust them it's just and, right, also, and it's snape and who saves him isn't it is it snape, snape who always kind of saves him. and busts in and like he busts in yeah. and controls Barty first and then Dumbledore comes in but I think the other thing that's kind of a subtle trust issue that happens in this movie as well is that Dumbledore didn't catch it either right so now this person who is supposed to be the most powerful wizard that I know and really seems to believe in me and trust in me he also didn't know that this was happening right so now no one can keep me safe i would see harry being in a trauma state for weeks after this all of this happens oh, at minimum yeah. and i mean it's... his ability to trust adults just continues to be destroyed and not because it's like adults are not i mean they're min- they're like intentionally malev- like malevolently not trustful but then also in this very like incidentally kind of idiotic way also not trustful right yeah. so i think from here this is a natural springboard to build into treatment which we've kind of worked in a little yeah. bit so yeah. I, I we've kind of talked about a little bit and i feel like i mean any trauma situation that comes up i'm going to default to emdr <laughs> because that's what i specifically took to train but i've also covered that in a lot of podcasts so i'm going to kind of decline to do that in this one because i've covered that a lot of times because mm-hmm. we've talked about a lot of trauma but like with treatment in this we haven't talked a lot about how I think group as a modality is 
helpful mm. and important. And so I think I kind of want to highlight that in here because I think in this situation, breaking down some of the kids into groups for some of the things that they're dealing with because we've got a couple kids that deal with anxiety. Mm-hmm. And we've got a couple kids that deal with some depression. And we've got a couple kids that deal with trauma. What I would argue that Neville Longbottom and Harry are very unique in that they have almost the same situation. Correct. In terms of their parents and losing them and at uh, as babies. And, like, they they would... And Neville seems, maybe because his grandma seems a lot... And maybe his disposition is a lot more gent- gentle than Harry. But he's also very brave and has a good heart. And so I think that, like you're saying, would be a good opportunity to be in a room with someone who is, in a lot of ways, the same circumstances as you. To feel more connected to other people and to feel like you're not alone in your trauma. Right, in right. your experience. And in my defense of that would be like, I mean, this comes out later in the movies, but like when they start creating Dumbledore's army and things like that, and you start to see the growth out of Neville and the growth mm-hmm. out of some of the other characters who before didn't really have a role or a place where they yeah. start to get some belief in themselves and connect into other people and go like, okay, so it's not just Harry that's this fantastical, magical person. It's like other people that can find meaning and purpose and development Mm -hmm. in their life. And I think having a group modality to do that and explore some of that to like create or like eliminate some of this. Harry is like the golden child and Mm -hmm. Hermione is like the smartest. Like there's other kids that are smart. Like Mm -hmm. we're hardly exposed to, especially in the movies, like, the Ravenclaws that, like, Hermione is way more similar to than the Gryffindors. Like, granted, she's very brave and true-hearted, but she's also, like, totally into her books, and that is, like, one of the clear defining characteristics Mm -hmm. of the Ravenclaws, and we don't have any exposure to them hardly at all throughout the series. I mean, Cho is one, but other than that, you don't really have... Luna is! Luna Lovegood. She's gonna come up yet, but she's my fave. Yeah, and (laughs) and we don't see that, but I think, like, creating a spot where it's not so much, like these special kids get singled out like but where we have something a trained therapist that can focus on bringing out the community the camaraderie and the Mm -hmm. ability to connect all these kids i think that would be what i would want to see happen and i don't yeah especially because i think you see harry really blossom in that role when he when he's training the kids and how that really helps him build Mm -hmm. a safe stable identity for himself of how he can take what he has and also get some more support around how kind of he is really good at some things yep right i mean like the Mm -hmm. fact that he could do the patronus the way that he did in the third movie or whatever whatever yeah the third which is a super advanced magic yeah like the way that he can do things that he can share it and that Mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be something that's special to him he doesn't have to hoard these things and how so yeah i think doing group would be just really really powerful for for harry and well, for every, yeah. and for all the kids struggling with different things like the the only and like the thing i really want to highlight is one of the things that the strengths of group particularly with kids this age and done by a skilled professional and i'd probably want their like to be groups to be run by two like because yeah. one of the things in group modality you don't see often anymore outside of hospitals that's really part of the group modality is to have a leader and a co-leader mm-hmm and you may want to do that with people of different genders or different identity types so that you can play off each other and model roles. Mm-hmm. Like, people like Harry wouldn't have even gotten that. Um, like you see, like, the difference, like, you'd have somebody like Sirius and then somebody like McGonagall. Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. like blending, like, the two, and not because they're male and female, but because their personalities. So something like one's a little wild and one's, like, strict rule follower. Uh, and having that would be helpful. But also, it would help address the bullying that is clearly a problem at this school that the teachers do shit about. Yeah. And I you have probably a problem want with that. the groups to have blended houses. Agreed. You probably yeah. want them to make sure that there's kids of every house in the group. Yep. And, and I think, cause I've run a lot of groups with kids as little as five. And so there's always an argument that people like to make the argument that kids, especially young kids can't do groups because they're not emotionally mature enough, but they are, if they can hold a conversation, they can be in a group. Yeah. Oh, I've yeah. done groups and, with kids. That's patently false. Yeah. And so, I think what's really powerful about groups, too, is, well, one, I think kids, too, because you're younger and everything's so much more black and white, if you feel alone, you genuinely feel like you're alone. And it's really hard for you because you're still developing your empathy to understand that other people have a similar experience to you just because that part of your brain's not fully developed yet to really be able to understand that other people have had things happen to them that's very similar to you. Mm -hmm. And so you can feel even more isolated because of that. And so why groups at that age are really powerful 
like that's why I brought up Neville is hearing someone have a story that's like your story makes you feel a lot less like you're a bad kid and that's why that's happened to you it makes right. it more about that the situation just fucking sucks or the people that did that right. thing to you are the bad guys not you because you're the only person that's ever happened to you is how it can feel yeah. and so when you realize it's happened to other kids and you like that kid and that kid's a nice kid yeah then it makes you kind of challenge how you've internalized what's happened to you Absolutely. and how maybe your parents treated you or how if someone abused you or something happened to you and so that's really powerful and also especially at this age 14 I mean, as much as I hate to admit it as an adult now, kids do not listen to you like they listen to their peers. Yeah. And so when their peers give them feedback, they will listen to that and take that more seriously a lot of the times than they will about an adult. Because it's very easy for them to be like, oh, fucking grown up, they don't get it. Oh, yeah. Or they're just telling me what to do. And they can very easily like write off and compartmentalize what you're saying. But I've seen groups where like, if a kid their age can say something to them that's very powerful, it, like, will knock a kid's block off in a good way. It'll, yeah. like, blow their mind. And it'll mean something so much more to them. Because also they're at an age where just your peers and their opinions are so fucking important. That's just, why they're all having, like, so these much tantrums weight like they are. On your identity. Yeah. Right. But it also gives them equal ground. And, like, yeah. It's, yeah. it's the great equalizer. It's going to, like, have someone in there that will enforce, like, mm-hmm. everybody's different and everybody's experiences are valuable. But... Mm-hmm. everybody's opinion and insight is just as valuable and you're all on equal footing. And I think, yeah. like, for me, that's what I would want to see. What about you two? I mean, I think what you said, the group's really good. I was um, I was thinking if I saw Harry after, at any point in these movies, at this age, like, at this younger age in his life, I think especially after, like, the first or second movies, if I were to see him, I'd probably be very person-centered. And what I mean by that is let him lead the sessions because I think, for a lot of his younger life, he's not been listened to and not been treated with like that he has a voice and an opinion that deserves respect. And so I wouldn't want to be another adult who's kind of like leading him around or bossing him around, you know, or feeling like I have an agenda. Like I would probably do a lot in session of like leaning back and letting him talk about whatever he wants to talk about so that he feels empowered about having an opinion and about having a voice and kind of going from there. And I would also assume that it'd probably take a while before we talked about really serious stuff. Yeah. But also I will take that back too, because sometimes when I work with kids like that, as soon as they have a space to talk about what they want to talk about, sometimes they'll just go like they hit the ground running Absolutely. and they're like, fucking finally somebody like gives a shit and they'll like just barf all their feelings onto you. Right. And so I think I would do a lot of letting him lead so that he felt empowered in sessions with me. And then I think a lot of this Harry Potter stuff is really could be used really interesting in therapy like the mirror of Izzered Mm -hmm. is a really good example of what we call magical thinking or the magical questions how I and what I mean by that is I usually use what we call I call the magic wand question which is if you had a magic wand and you could wave it and it'd make your life whatever you wanted it to be or like the perfect version of your life, what would it look like? Yeah. And so you could use the mirror of Izrad as kind of like, if you looked in that mirror, what would you see? And it can be really insightful to understanding what they really want. And also if their expectations of a perfect life are realistic, like if they're waiting on something or depending on something that's not going to ever really happen, or that doesn't need to happen for them to have a good life. Or it can also be insightful because maybe the perfect world is without them in it. Right. And that's, you know, could be right. like a really scary response, but also tells you a lot about what their head's at. And I think another thing that I thought of as a therapist when I was watching it was in the third movie, Lupin does of this the ridiculous spell with them, which is where he has them all think of like, a I think it's a Bogart. He has them see something that really scares them. And then he um supposed to reframe it to something that makes you laugh. And yeah. I thought that was a really good way of changing your thought about something really scary as well as thinking about something really funny and that way you can think about it differently and it's not as scary anymore what about you hannah um so i think that i would do you know i think you guys have really great suggestions and i don't know that i would do something a lot differently and because right now there's so many different groups of them i was trying to think of like who would i have in my office like for family therapy and maybe it would be dumbledore like having dumbledore and harry and maybe Sirius and just helping them with communication because it's so clear that that is is yeah it's so clear that that is something that they would really need help with so i think i would just try to help Harry find safe 
find safe adults that he can work with. Yeah. And I don't know if that's something that could be done with other people or not. It might be too hard for him to process that at that time. Well, I think it'd be really hard. I think maybe in nothing else you can teach him, like, how do you know if someone's a healthy exactly. attachment or not? And, oh, then that's a huge thing. And you can, create, and you can yeah. create supports that aren't your family. Cause I exactly. Think moving him away from trying to make something work with the Dursleys or serious because they're his family, quote right. unquote, and being like, no, you can find support with your friends and the people that you choose. And that could be more powerful. Yeah. It's the whole, like, you know, blood's thicker than water kind of argument. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So that's what I would do. Well, final thoughts. I mean, I love Harry Potter. Like, if I like, <laughs> if I had to put it in like my like pantheon of movies, like my top fives, like this Harry Potter the series is up there. I love it. I think it's fantastic. I think it's permeated culture well and is existing well. And I look forward to reading it to my daughter when she's old enough to understand. Adorable. Aww, it's so cute. I mean, I love that these movies, and we'll get into this more when we do the other four. That they grow with the children. They become more mature as the kids in the story become more mature. And the movies also do that. And that they take a lot of these the way the kids feel seriously. Which is a child therapist I'm all about. And they don't. it's not just serious stuff they take seriously. But like the romance. And the fourth, and the fourth movie is all about romance. And not be able to get your shit together. <laughs> yeah. Um, I love Harry Potter and I watch it all the time and I have a <laughs> Deathly Hallows tattoo on my arm. Um, so I love it. And I, it was really, it was a lot of fun to do this episode and I look forward to doing the other two episodes for you guys. All right. And so we will be on hiatus for the next month of September just because of scheduling and things like that. But we will be back in October with scary movies for Halloween. So look for us then. Um, you can also find us on Facebook and Instagram at Popcorn Psychology. You can find us at Popcorn Psychology at gmail.com if you want to email us um and we are on twitter popcorn underscore psych and yeah so find us if you would like 